Incorporation is a doctrine that answers a specific question about individual rights under the U.S. Constitution. Namely, which level of government is limited by which rights? The next few slides illustrate the problem. The First Amendment, among other things, says that Congress shall make no laws abridging the freedom of speech. Now, this plainly acts as a limit on federal lawmaking power, but the states are not Congress. Does this mean that the states are free to abridge freedom of speech? Now, the state constitution might have its own protections for freedom of speech that might limit a state government. But if there are no such state laws, and if the First Amendment does not limit the state, then free speech within that state is not legally guaranteed. A similar question exists in the reverse direction. The 14th Amendment, enacted just after the Civil War, says that states may not deprive equal protection of the laws. Now, this plainly limits the power of state government, but the federal government is not a state. So does that mean that the federal government is allowed to deny equal protection of the laws? These are the text-based puzzles that the incorporation doctrine was created to answer. And the best way to understand incorporation is to track the changes in the Constitution's text in roughly chronological order. When first written and ratified, the U.S. Constitution had only a few passages that unambiguously created individual rights. These were found in Article I, Section 9, which limited the federal government, and Article I, Section 10, which limited state governments. As you will remember, during the ratification debates, there were many concerns that this new federal government was not expressly required to respect many of the individual rights that had been protected by most state constitutions. Things like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, or freedom from unreasonable search and seizure. To deal with this criticism, the very first Congress proposed a set of constitutional amendments known as the Bill of Rights. And these included a number of individual rights that we take for granted today. Things like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and so on. But what happens if a state constitution does not protect one of the rights in the Federal Bill of Rights? That was the question in Barron v. Baltimore. The plaintiff claimed that a local government had taken his property for a public purpose without paying just compensation. Now, if the federal government had taken this property, it would have violated the Takings Clause of the Fifth Amendment. But there was nothing in the state law that required the state or local governments to pay just compensation. So the question became, does the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution limit the states? In a unanimous opinion written by Chief Justice John Marshall, the Supreme Court held that it did not. After reviewing the Constitution's text, history, and structure, the court concluded that unless the text specifically refers to states, like it had done in Article I, Section 10, then the rights in the U.S. Constitution limit only the federal government, not state governments. Most people agree that Barron was correctly decided, based on the Constitution as it existed in 1833. But it meant that states could violate rights with impunity, and some of them did. The most obvious violation, of course, was slavery, which denied enslaved people their liberty and pretty much any other rights. After the Civil War, a national consensus emerged that the states could not always be trusted to protect individual rights, and so more was needed on the federal level. The Reconstruction Amendments created some new rights that limited the federal government. The Reconstruction Amendments also created new rights that limited the state governments. Keeping Barron in mind, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments explicitly said that the rights they created applied to the states. And then finally, the Reconstruction Amendments gave enforcement powers to Congress, which could further limit state laws through the Supremacy Clause. The Reconstruction Amendments did not explicitly say anything about the rights found in the first eight amendments, nothing specific about speech, religion, and so on. But perhaps those amendments, and in particular the 14th Amendment, had language that in effect applied the U.S. Bill of Rights to the states. For example, the 14th Amendment said that states 
may not abridge privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. So what were those privileges or immunities enjoyed by citizens of the United States? A good argument existed to say that they included the rights identified in the Bill of Rights. Now this argument has some logic and some history supporting it, but the Supreme Court rejected it in United States versus Cruikshank. This was one of many decisions in the 1870s that drained most of the usefulness out of the 14th Amendment Privileges or Immunities Clause. A few decades after Cruikshank, more and more people began to believe that it was wrong to allow states to ignore rights that the federal government was required to respect. So lawyers and judges gradually turned their focus to the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause. That clause said, among other things, that states could not deprive people of liberty without due process. And under this theory, the word liberty incorporated the ideas from the original Bill of Rights. This is the exact same kind of incorporation by reference that you might see in a contract or in a complaint in a civil case. Incorporation is where words in one document are incorporated into another document without repeating them word by word. And the same thing can happen for words in one section of a document being incorporated into another. Now the incorporation idea took many decades to get fully hashed out, but by at least the late 1960s it had been decided that any rights from the original Bill of Rights that were considered fundamental were incorporated by reference into the meaning of liberty in the 14th Amendment. And over the years, almost all of these rights have been deemed to be fundamental. 14th Amendment incorporation explains why the states have to respect rights from the First Amendment, even though the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law. The idea of freedom of speech is incorporated into the meaning of liberty, as it appears in the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause. And by its express language, that Due Process Clause limits the states. This process explains why you might sometimes see courts saying that allegations of a state violating freedom of speech arise under the First and 14th Amendments. In this quote, the court explains that freedom of expression is guaranteed by the combination of the First and Fourteenth Amendments. And in some cases, the court simply speaks about the First and Fourteenth Amendments generally, without specific reference to the Free Speech Clause. Finally, the same logic also applies under the Fifth Amendment Due Process Clause. This explains why the federal government is limited by equal protection. Remember, the 14th Amendment says no state shall deny equal protection, and it says nothing about the U.S. government. But the federal government has to obey its own due process clause. So the word liberty in the Fifth Amendment has been understood to incorporate the requirement of equal protection of the laws.